Hey, you Coach, how you doing today? Um, can you? What happened on the uh, the timeout? Was that you know uh, the special team being on the field and and and, and not knowing they were going to go for two or or not go for two, but actually going for it on fourth down? What happened to confusion there in the Arizona game with that timeout that was called? Yeah, I don't think there was any confusion. They ran on their snapper and their kicker, so you're looking at the sideline, and as soon as I see the specialists come on the field, I call for field goal block personnel, and the quarterback was going off, and then real quick he ran back on. Um, and so we had basically a, a hybrid defense on the field, which is our field goal block personnel. Then one of our young guys kind of kind of panicked a little bit, and we tried to keep him on the field, and we didn't want to call a timeout because they probably weren't going to run a play. Um, but then we ended up calling a timeout just, just to get everything settled. But um, it wasn't really confusion. They just, you know, they did something that was, that was different. They claim they baited you guys into a timeout. Did you, did you feel like they, that's what they did? I don't think they baited us into a timeout. We ended up taking it just um, to get ourselves settled. But um, I don't think we were baited into a timeout. We had the right person on the field. It's just something I can do a better job of making adjustments to a, a hybrid offense and a hybrid field goal team on the field at the same time. So um, good stuff for me to, to tighten up for us, for sure. Greg missed the field goal, ultimately a three-point decision of the game. When you see his misses left and they have had some of the same trajectories, do you think it's more of a trend or a case-by-case -case basis? What do you make of it? I think it's, yeah, case-by-case -case basis and, you know, Got to make the kicks. He knows that. I know that. Everybody knows that. And any game we play in, every point is valuable, whether it's one or three or two or six. Um, that one, with the disappointing part for him was usually he's, he's kind of gearing up and he's taking a good swing at it. That one he felt, through his own words, that he kind of aimed, you know, and he doesn't do that. And aiming isn't good for business. And so um, if he was going to get one of those out, you know, an aim, that would be the one to do it, and I don't anticipate him having any more, you know, aimed misses. Considering, John, considering where this COVID stuff is going on and, and things, is it good to have a get a second kicker on your practice squad nowadays just to make sure you got a leg, you got another guy that in case something were to happen to Greg or, or maybe even Brian, I don't know at this time of year with the way practices are to have extra legs around? Yeah, the only thing about that is Greg had COVID a month ago, so I don't, I don't know what the exact rules and protocols are anymore, but I think Greg's clear of that because he'd had it just a couple weeks ago. Um, to your point, yeah, I think, you know, I think some teams do it. Um, I don't think we need to do it for reasons I'll keep to myself, but um, I, think, I think we're out of that, so I think we should be good. How do you try not to overanalyze some of the misses by Greg? I know that the majority of his misses at home have come toward the West End zone. How do yeah. you say he just missed it and let's move on or don't overanalyze it in a sense? No, we definitely don't do that, but it's a great point, you know, Calvin. We actually spent a couple of days ago, myself, Jake, Brian, and Greg, we sat down and we went through all of Greg's 77 kicks this year. We did that. He's had a grand total of 77 combination PATs and field goals. And we went through each one. And then we really kind of spent a little more time on the misses and said, hey, on this one, you know, what was it? Hold, the snap good? Yep. The hold good? You know, good. Tweak it here a little bit. Um, and the operation has been good. You know, for Greg, it's, you know, I had my foot slightly open. Um, my plant foot was a little bit too. Everyone is just a little bit different. And so we really did a great deep dive. I thought it was a great exercise for us to go through and just, you know, talk about every kick, especially the ones that have been misses. Um, and I said, you know, this isn't any extra pressure on anybody. And if it is, maybe that's a good thing. If it's not, whatever. It's just we're just having a good football discussion on, you know, the opportunities we get and making sure we capitalize on them, you know, because our football team needs the one, two, three, and six pointers every time that we go out there on the field. So. Um, we actually did that this week. So to your point, yeah, it was good to not overanalyze it, but our job as coaches and players is to keep critiquing and finding ways to improve um, or ways to tighten things up if they need tightening up, myself included. You know, we're all, I'm all part of that too. Those little sub-
irregularities in Greg's picking mechanics or approach on the misses? You've been around for a long time. Is that uncommon for him? Or has it just showed up this year and showed up more misses? Or how do you evaluate that in relation to the rest of his career? Yeah, that's, that's a good one. Um, I think I probably used this before. Sometimes like a like a basketball, you know, three point specialist. I think through anybody's career, you go through you're hot, and then you go through some times where man, I just I can't I, I can't find it, you know. But I'm gonna I'm gonna find it. Um, so through Greg's career, you know, he's been hot a lot, and there has been moments where he just feels like you know it just it's just off by. You can't see it on film, coach, but it's it's just off by this much, and you know, it's, and he'll find it for sure. I think over the last couple of weeks, he just he just is just a little bit off, and he knows it, um, and he knows better than anybody, including myself, how to kind of fix it and tighten it up. I mean, we're talking splitting hairs, um, but but I know when Greg's been counted on, you know, he's always produced, and I have no reservations that he's going to produce for us here in the next you know month and a half um, but it has been great to be a part of his career to, to see you know the ebbs and flows of being hot and kind of being cold and you know kick being a kicker is hard because if you miss as a kicker you know it's, it's wide left or wide right and you missed it if you miss it as a punter it might hit the ground and roll for 20 yards and hey that's a great 53 yard net punt so um, there's a lot more critique that goes with kickers missing um, and he's a pro, and I'm talking way too much. <laughs> um, but we had a really good couple of days ago just talking about all this. Um, and it's probably going to be kind of like Tampa, you know, had a couple misses, and then he comes back and he hits some game winners. So um, part of this, too, is a product of, you know, he had the surgery in May, so he missed a lot of spring and summer where he usually finds kind of that sweet spot. Um, training camp was getting his leg back to just being able to swing. And so, you know, in a little bit of fairness to him, he spent quite a bit of time during the season doing what he'd normally do in the summer, um, still trying to find that thing. You know, he's going to find it. He's going to find it. Mark my word. And if not, then put it on me, but he's going to find it. And it's going to be a big one. I've seen it before. John, we're all expecting a fake punt from the Cardinals last week, and can you take us through that play, how Nation played it, and also, I mean, just how ridiculous that catch was? Yeah, I mean, I think every game we go into, we, we have defense mechanisms in place for anybody that, you know, might try something. And where they tried it is a very popular spot, you know, fourth and short, 30-yard line, you know, early in the game. So we had um, – we had an eight box call on. We had two guys kind of spying their personal protector. And Nashon did a hell of, yeah, I'm sorry, did a great job of manning his eligible, you know, and the receiver number 29, who's a running back for them, really good special teams guy, made a play you've seen twice, once in the Super Bowl, and um, somehow he stuck that catch. But um, Nashon's kind of been at the center of some of those storms, you know, the block punt that he touched, the block punt the next week that he recovered. Um, a great defense of a fake punt, in my opinion, where he ran with the eligible on a, on a, tough, on a tough defense. I, I didn't see defensive pass interference. I thought he played it outstanding. And give Arizona kid credit. He made a great catch. He made a great catch. Hey, John, real quick, just, and I know it, it doesn't ultimately matter because Ward made that great catch, but I've seen a lot of conflicting information about whether or not you can commit DPI on a fake punt. Like, so is, would that have been a penalty if he hadn't caught the ball? That's a great question. Yeah, it's a very, very unique rule. So on a punting play from a traditional punt formation, there's no defensive pass interference or illegal contact on the furthest aligned guys outside on each side of the football, which would be like your gunners. So there's, there's no DPI penalties or illegal contact penalties on those guys. There is defensive holding on like your gunners. But anybody that's an interior guy or anybody that's not the widest on each side of the ball, DPI, illegal contact, and defensive holding all apply to those guys. So Nashawn was right. You know, he can't just go shove the guy and knock him down because DPI would apply to that. That's why you saw him running with him, basically with his hands up, knowing like, I don't see the ball, but I know the ball's coming, but I can't pass interfere. Um, so 
that's why they threw the flag, even though I, I would tend to disagree with it. But if he did DPI, then that flag would have stood and would have been the right call. So pretty unique, huh? That was a unique one. Y'all wind up in these situations a lot where we're trying to break down <laughs> the minutia of what happened. But thank you for that. Yeah. 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 It's um, yeah. We're kind of seems like we're centered for that quite a bit on some pretty unique. Like, gosh, I haven't seen that one ever. On one of the, uh, the Brian Anger's punts, uh, CJ weaved between two guys on the punt return team and then dropped the returner for a five-yard loss. What stood out most on that play from him? Yeah, I mean, he, gosh, he's, he's incredible. You really feel his speed. It's cool to be on the sideline because a lot of times he'll, he'll be running right past me as he's going to chase the returner. And he is so fast. Like, you can feel the speed. It's like, whoa, Jesus. Um, but what stood out the most, I mean, probably was the finish. You know, he got there, and the returner started running away from him. And we had this tackle CJ did against Philadelphia, our first game against him, where he didn't slow down. He just hit the gas, and he chased that back hip. And the guy felt him, and he kind of tried to, you know, evade it. And CJ just shot that back hip. And it was just an incredible tackle, especially when you see it on the coach's copy, because he's probably running 22 and a half miles per hour. And to be able to make, you know, a, that – good of an open field tackle is very, very difficult and very special. And it's something he actually learned from, from our first Philadelphia game where he just missed on Jalen Rager, um, almost the same exact position, and he nailed this one. And that was a huge play. I mean, it was a great play. And then, uh, lastly, we talked a couple weeks ago about the final 20 or so minutes of that Washington game where all the personnel substitutions and um, – sorry um, – and – how, as a special teams coordinator, there's a lot of organizing that needs to take place in order to respond. Going into this game, where it's week 18, there is an evolving medical situation with COVID that it could impact player availabilities, and with the playoffs so near, how are you preparing for that potential fire alarm in the game where maybe guys are not are starting the game but not finishing it? Yeah, that's a good one. That's That was today, in a nutshell, right there. So. Uh, myself and Coach Daniels, we spent Monday, Tuesday accelerating the game plan because of the short week, and we kind of came up with a plan. And then as it's evolved the last couple of days, the plans have mightily changed. <laughs> um, I mean, this is something that's very uncharted waters, even going into preseason games. So we had a, you know, a good about 45-minute special teams walkthrough, and we said, hey, let's just let's rally, let's, let's do this, let's start all over again. And hey, you got to go here, you got to go here. Um, you know, Anthony Brown's on COVID. COVID, you know, maybe COVID, maybe COVID. And so um, here's our plan, guys, going in. You might be up, you might be down, you might be in. We alerted all the practice squad guys that, you know, make sure you guys are ready. And if you do go in, this is where you're going to play. So this morning, um, Michael was a fascinating walkthrough for us. And it was kind of a new one for me where, you know, hey, come on in here, guys, and let's – Let's talk and walk this through. We were going to have an install, and we are going to have a real good film session. And we just aborted that because we had to almost just reload and say, hey, I know you didn't anticipate playing, but you're actually in, man, and, and you got to do this. So um, it was a lot of fun. It was actually very fascinating. And um, I anticipate us playing at a very high level Saturday night, no matter who's in there. All right, thanks, everybody. Thanks, you guys, gals. Thanks, John.